Hello, everyone. I am Gwydion Sullivan, Penn Faulkner's Executive Director. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Money, which should be a spectacular conversation about a subject I know we're all thinking about, perhaps more so in the last two years than ever before. I want to tell you a little bit about Penn Faulkner. We believe that the arts can help create an equitable, just, and flourishing world. And our role is to provide rich literary experiences for as many people as we can. You may know us for giving out big awards like the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction or for holding programs like we're having tonight, but a very large part of what we do is education. We bring free books, visits from authors, and writing instruction into low-income schools in DC. Our goal is to create learning environments where students can relate to the books they read and find inspiration in the lives of the authors they meet and develop their own writing skills and their own voices. And those of you who donated to join us here tonight have already helped make that possible. And I am very grateful, especially given that we're all here to talk tonight about money. And if you, if you haven't contributed yet and you have the means in this difficult time, I sincerely hope that you will. You can use the link that's about to appear in the chat to do that. And really even $10 or $15 gets us started and makes a difference for a, a young person. But thank you so much. And, and now for tonight's program, we are very lucky to be joined tonight by four very impressive people. Mateo Ascarapor's work aims to empower people of color to seize opportunities for advancement no matter the obstacle. He was chosen as one of Entertainment Weekly's 10 rising stars to make waves in 2021, as well as a 2018 Rhode Island Writers Colony writer in residence. And his writing has appeared in Entrepreneur, Lit Hub, Catapult, and elsewhere. His debut novel, Black Buck, was an instant New York Times bestseller and a read with Jenna Today Show book club pick. He lives in Brooklyn. You can follow him on Instagram and Twitter. Sherry Jones was born in 1974. She received an LLB degree from the University of the West Indies Barbados in 1995, a legal education certificate from the Hugh Wooding Law School, St. Augustine Trinidad in 1997, and was admitted to the bar in Barbados in October of 1997. Sherry won the Commonwealth Short Story Prize in 1999. She won both the Archie Markham Award and the A.M. Heath Prize at Sheffield Hallam in the UK. A collection of interconnected stories set in different small community, set in a different small community in Barbados, won a third prize at the Frank Collymore Endowment Awards in 2016. She still works as a lawyer in addition to her writing. Kevin Kwan is the author of Crazy Rich Asians, the international best-selling novel that's been translated into more than 30 languages. Its sequel, China Rich Girlfriend, was released in 2015, and Rich People Problems, the final book in the trilogy, followed in 2017. For several weeks in 2018, the Crazy Rich Asians trilogy commanded the top three positions in the New York Times bestseller list, an almost unprecedented single author trifecta. And the film adaptation of Crazy Rich Asians became Hollywood's highest grossing comedy, romantic comedy in more than a decade. In 2018, Kevin was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And last but not least, our moderator, Ruman Alam is the author of the novels Rich and Pretty, That Kind of Mother, and leave the world behind. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, New York Magazine, The New Yorker, The New York Review of Books, Book Forum, and The New Republic, where he is a contributing editor. He studied writing at Oberlin College and lives in New York with his family. Welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Gwydion, uh, and thank you to the Penn Faulkner Foundation. Um, it's really nice to hear a little bit about what the foundation's work does as we gather here tonight to talk about something that I have 
always been told is not a subject for a polite conversation, which is money. Um, so I guess, you know, I guess we should prepare for an impolite evening. Um, I'm going to ask the three writers who are joining me tonight about their relationships to money as a subject and about a host of other things. Um, I'm really curious to talk to them. And so I think we should just dive right in. Now, <clears throat> before we begin, I think it's useful to talk about the books under discussion, which are Mateo's novel, Black Buck. I was going to hold them up to the camera. I don't know why I have this weird like Price is Right instinct to hold them up, but so I will. Okay, Mateo's book, Black Buck, Cherry's book, How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, and Kevin's book, Sex and Vanity. Oh, it's, Kevin's book has such a shiny cover that it's distorting the light, <laughs> but you get, you get the picture, you get the picture. Um, I said to these guys before we started that I feel like it's a particular pain point for a writer to have to summarize a book that they spent you know, months, if not years of their life working on. You can't cram it into a 30 second pitch. And so I volunteered to do that on their behalf. So I'm going to give you the sales pitch on these individual books. And then I'm gonna ask each of the writers to read briefly from the book. Um, and I'm gonna proceed the only way that I know how, which is through the alphabet. So we're gonna start with Black Buck. Black Buck is the story of, I'm, I'm laughing because it is not even the book that I wrote and it's still hard for me to summarize, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Black Buck is the story of Darren, who is kind of a born salesman, who finds himself in what his family and friends consider a dead end job for someone of his skills. He's managing a Starbucks. And he has this chance encounter that leads him to a gig at a startup. It's a book about Darren's great success in the world of business, but it's also a book about the crisis of conscience that propels him to become a kind of double agent of American capitalism. Um, Mateo, I hope that I did, I hope that pitch was okay. Um, and I would love if great. you would, <laughs> I would love if you would read for us a bit. Yes, thank you, Ramon. Thank you, uh, Sherry, Kevin, and everyone else who has joined us today, and uh, Penn Block for, for hosting. I'm reading from the middle of the book. Um, all you really need to know is that um, the company, the startup, as Ramon said, that Darren, who is renamed as Buck, is working at, is going under, and there's an opportunity to save it. And Buck makes one fateful phone call. And this is towards the end of the conversation with that individual uh, named Barry D, a big media maven. All right. <clears throat> what else do you want? He laughed again, this time deeper, longer, and slower. I want you, my man. I want you. What does that mean? It means that every second you're not at someone, you work for me. My hands were shaking. I couldn't believe what was happening. I was ready for him to yell, psych, before hanging up. But I had to keep going just in case. And what does working for you entail? Oh, a lot of things. Helping me with investments, running errands, putting some of your raw potential to proper use. If you make me money, I'll make you money, but it'll come at a price. I'm not talking a measly 500 grand. Doing this deal, Buck, the deal I'm bringing to the table, means I own you. I didn't know Barry aside from his reputation as an energetic, ruthless, and pompous businessman, which made the prospect of being owned by him as appealing as chewing nails. But when I looked at Rhett, I already knew what I'd have to do. He gave me the opportunity I'd always wanted but didn't know I needed. Despite managing hundreds of employees, he made me feel as if I were the only one in the world when he looked at me. And I couldn't let that go, especially now when I'd lost everyone who had ever meant anything to me. Okay, Barry, I said, we have a deal. And what does having a deal mean, Buck? I want to hear you say it. I took a deep breath and looked around the room. Everyone stared at me, nodding. Back during hell week, they went to bat for me when I needed it most, and I needed to do the same for them. I truly believed in this company, so I had to give myself to it to do whatever it took to save it. Reader, this is uh, breaking the fourth wall, direct address to the reader. 
Reader, in the same way, there's no such thing as a halfway crook. There's no such thing as a halfway success. In sales and life, you're either all in or you're not. And if you're not, then set the fuck aside before you get run over by someone who is. I close my eyes and grip the receiver tighter. It means you own me, Barry. I'm yours. Thank you. That gives us a good taste of how Black Buck functions. Um, so we're going to hold on that for a minute. And we're going to talk about <clears throat> how the one arm sister sweeps her house, which has got to be one of the most arresting titles for a novel I've ever heard. It's really like such a good title. Um, the title of this novel is kind of the punchline or the moral of a cautionary story that's delivered from grandmother to granddaughter. The granddaughter is a girl named Lala and by nature, she's destined to kind of disobey the warning in her grandmother's story. The warning is don't be curious because you could lose a limb. And then how will you sweep your house? Lala is sort of determined to test the limits of how to live and how to live curiously on her own terms. I'm gonna ask Sherry to read a little bit from her beautiful book. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. So I'm going to read from chapter 20, which is just past midway through the book. Um, and yeah, it's it takes place. It's from a scene where Lala is being questioned by a policeman about a crime that takes place earlier in the novel. So 20th August, 1984. If we were to look for Lala, and if we were to find her on the flank of Baxter's Deep, knuckle deep in the hair of a stranger, if we were to walk up to her and ask her whether she knows the frowsy beach bum, the one at whom our island women chooks, the one the memory of whom makes some tourist women breathe faster, we would notice first how she keeps her gaze on the head in front of her when she queries, who? As if she's deliberately avoiding our eyes. Her fingers would not slow down, not then. They would keep weaving hair at a speed that would seem incapable of measurement. Over, under, over, under, over, under, over, under, over. We might describe Robert Paris, also known as Tone, first in physical terms, because his form, rusty shoulder length locks, average height, slim build, sinewy and strong, is what is first obvious to anyone who looks at him. We would explain that we're talking about the one whose toenails are washed white as surf, whose skin is salted with the fine white dust of a living maid on the beach. We would explain that the hair on his head and hands has become the gold of the sun so that, like the sun, we would not see it if we look at him straight on. When Lala still feigns ignorance of his acquaintance, we could refer to his quirks, the shark tooth necklace he wears around his neck and kisses before he ventures into the water, the way he slaps the surface of the sea with his jet ski, so that the older swimmers startle and the younger ones spit obscenities. The tendency he has to take the unruly locks at the crown of his head and squeeze them to get rid of the salt water while bent over at the waist. And because Robert Paris is a subject that must be avoided at all costs, we would hear Lala say again, who? even as her fingers slow their speed on the hair in front of her. Over, under, over, under, over, under, stop. And it is only after she realizes that we will keep asking until she answers. After we have described in, in him in such a way that it would be more suspicious if she said she does not know him 
that we would find this small, brittle smile of recognition. Oton, Lala would say, yes, yes, I know him. And her hands would start to trip over themselves to drop the silken strands of flaxen hair before her so that she will have to start the cornrow all over again. Over, stop, over, stop, under, stop, over, stop, over, under, over, under, stop. If we were to push further to ask how she knows him, her eyes would fall from the hair in which she has tangled her fingers and land on her feet, where a fly would be broaching the sticky sweet memory of a drop of snow foam dried on her toe. And her eyes would stay there while we reassure the Taurus between Lala's legs. This Taurus would now be closing her book, gathering her towel, saying she can come back when we're done, hesitating with a half done head when we tell her, it is okay, she can stay. This will only take a few minutes. Perhaps prior to the death of her baby, Lala's smile would have widened and her, why you wanna know, would not have led to more probing while she plaited cornrows with such tenderness that her client would have started to doze off her hair now being done in the land of dreams. Before the death of the baby, we might have said we were asking because we have seen the way he looks at her when he lands on the beach with the roar of the jet ski and the water only just rejoining behind him. Had we not been aware that she was wedded to another man, we might have told her. We would have taken this tone for her husband. Were we not aware that this tone sells his body to the tourist women on the beach, we would believe that this body is hers. So studiously does she avoid devouring it with her eyes in the way her client cannot help but do. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I very, very rarely look at a book's jacket copy. I know that they're like editors, like spend a lot of time laboring on that, but I like to dive into a book without knowing too much about it. And so I was pretty well into Kevin Kwan's Sex and Vanity before it occurred to me that there was something familiar about it. I was like, wait a minute, a girl being accompanied by a kind of fussy cousin and they're in Italy, like what? what is this making me think of? And so then of course I looked at the jacket copy and I was like, oh, of course, Kevin is writing a kind of homage or riff on Ian Forster's A Room With A View. Um, like that book, this is a comedy of manners. It's a book about love and freedom and sort of like the development of the self, but it's not just a kind of retread of a story that you think you know, at least I didn't find it to be that at all. Um, Kevin, I wonder if you'll read for us a little bit from this book. Happily, and it's really such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, it's been a while since I've actually read from this book, so I might be a bit rusty. Um, and let me just give a very quick setup. Um, so in this, little passage, we're really in the mind of um, the heroine of the book, Lucy Tang Churchill. Um, she is in a rather tangled mess. You know, she's torn between two men, one that she's engaged to and the other one that she's just irresistibly drawn to. And so we're, we're in her head here as she's sort of assessing what to do. Um, so I will begin. George was the polar opposite of the kind of guys she liked. He didn't grow up in New York. He wasn't suave and sophisticated. He didn't dress properly. He didn't in any way resemble Carrie Elways in The Princess Bride. He was nothing like the husband she had always envisioned for herself. He had driven her crazy and done nothing but mess up her life and mess with her head since the moment she had first set eyes on him in the lunchroom of the Bertolucci. And the one thing she hated more than anything was messy. Her life, her image, her whole being up till this point had been a study in perfection. 
She had gone to Brerley and had always been the popular girl, Lucy Tang Churchill, the cool half Asian girl. She had graduated from Brown with honors. She had landed her dream job at the coolest company in town. And she was about to marry a dashing erudite gentleman whom even Esquire proclaimed the most desired dude on the planet. They would live in an exquisitely original townhouse in the West Village, summer in East Hampton, and maybe even get a place in Provence. They would both serve on the boards of the Brooklyn Museum and PS1, and maybe even the DIA. They would in precisely four and a half years start to have beautiful, gifted children, a boy, then a girl, who would attend St. Bernard's and Brearley, followed by Harvard or Brown or Bard. Actually, no, no, not Bard. Brearley girls didn't go to Bard. And be adored by everyone, adored by Granny, adored by all the Churchills. And if all went as planned, she would see Cecil and her children's names appear alongside hers in the social register. And it would be the happiest day of Cecil's life. There was no way in hell she was going to let George ruin this magnificent life she had planned out for herself since she was eight years old. All the happiness in her future, her family's future, her children's future, depended on the removal of George Zhao from her life. Well, you guys have to read the book to understand, to figure out what's going to actually happen to Lucy. Um, before I dive into the many questions that I prepared for these guys, I wanted to note that um, we'll take audience questions and you should ask them, I think at this point in American history, most of us have used Zoom, but uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can type your question in there and um, I'll get to those after I give these guys the third degree um, to satisfy my own curiosity. Um, so, you know, these are three very different writers and three very different books. But the reason that I think we're here tonight, the three of you are here tonight is because there are these resonances across the work and I would love to tease some of them out. Um, as the name of this conversation suggests, money is sort of principle in this conversation. Matteo, I wonder if you could answer the extent to which money as a subject, whatever that means to you, was your subject or whether it was a way of talking about something else entirely in Black Buck. Yeah, um, it's hard to imagine that this book would exist without money. Right, I, 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 it's hard for me to even think of any work that would exist without money having an effect on it in some way or another. Right, Darren's working at Starbucks, and uh, I really like how you phrase that it's a quote unquote dead end job to his family and friends. Because for me, um, when people ask, Why did you portray this young man who was valedictorian of one of the top public schools in America working at Starbucks, you know, wasting his potential. I say, well, you know, that that calls into question what is success, you know, in this in this nation or in this world. Um, and we see the cost that he has to pay when he begins to chase another person's definition of success defined by this suave, good looking white CEO, Rhett Daniels. Um, that <coughs> pursuit of this version of success, I will say, and it's hard for me to speak for the character, but I believe it's not driven by money. It's more so driven by the idea of achieving the potential that those who love him unconditionally believe that he has. And then, you know, proving all of these white people that work in this startup that he can outwork them. Money is a byproduct, but we see the way that it changes him. I mean, myself, when I was younger, I was 23, 24, working at a startup myself, managing 30 people, making over six figures. I never made that much money in my life. And I'm not going to say that the money changed me, but things are different when you don't have to, you know, ask yourself, all right, am I going to spend five or $10 on lunch mm. versus never even caring? I think that it does have an effect on your psyche. So in this narrative, I'm showing the different ways that money has an unconscious or unconscious impact on people's lives. 
I'm showing how um, oftentimes people will regard an individual as an employee rather than a person. And that there's a difference and that people in these organizations will oftentimes claim that they're looking to change the world or hold on to some weird notion of like manifest destiny in the 21st century, right? If we must expand, we must colonize, we must disrupt when in fact, they're really just looking to put profits over people in order to achieve some weirdly erotic end, <laughs> you know, that might result in a, a you know, like a million dollars or, or a billion dollars or calling your uh, organization a unicorn, which is another weird term that they have in the start. Right. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, those those were some of the motivations behind um, the narrative and, and how I believe money plays into it. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, Kevin, you're a writer in the cultural imagination who's so closely associated with like money as a subject. I mean, for, for God's sakes, like crazy rich Asians, I don't really think you have to say much more than that. But I suspect that your project as a novelist isn't exactly what it might seem or what the, what the, the title Crazy Rich Asians or even Sex and Vanity, what it might suggest. So I'm wondering whether you think money across that trilogy and across this new book is your subject or if it's a tool for, or like a trick for talking about something else? You know, I think it's a bit of both. Um, you know, money is so central and it's so dominant in the lives of, of all the people I write about. Um, you know, first of all, in, in the Crazy Rich Asians trilogy, you know, you're, you're looking at these different concentric circles of, of moneyed families and what money does to them, you know, um, both good and bad. And then in Sex and Vanity, I think we enter even more complex territory there because here you have all these different overlapping classes. You know, you have Lucy who is on her father's side, um, descendant from a very blue blood, waspy New York power elite family. And then on her mother's side, just a very average middle-class Asian American family. And then she's marrying Cecil, who comes from the new billionaire class. Um, so there's all these overlapping sort of status plays that happen. And I really wanted to sort of examine that um, and how those motivate the characters, how it motivates her when she's in her mind trying to assess what she should do. So Matteo spoke of like the tension between money and one sense of self. And Kevin, you're talking about this tension between money and class identity, which is like a different but interrelated thing. Cherry, your characters in your novel have a different relationship than those in Black Buck or Sex and Vanity to money because we're meeting people who are poor principally, right? And we're meeting them in a place that is sort of, that they refer to throughout the book as paradise. So we're seeing a paradise that belongs to the wealthy English white, uh, but is inhabited by the black West Indian with significantly less money and therefore power I wonder if you could talk about the extent to which that particular tension was part of the subject of your book. I think it definitely is a big part of what the book is about. I mean, one of the characters um, early on in the book, Mira Leland's mother, um, makes a comment that the two extremes of possession you know deprivation and deluge are especially crippling to the soul and a lot of this novel is about what life is like when you live in the postcard and are you know unable to participate in the luxury of it so we have some um financially you know 
probably very difficult circumstances. Um, our protagonist, main protagonist, and her husband, and they do all sorts of things just to be able to survive. Um, we meet male prostitutes, we meet female prostitutes, we, um, our protagonist braids hair for tourists on the beach, and they kind of eco living, doing various things just to survive. And there's this battle for survival in the face of some really wealthy um, tourists who live in these huge mansions on the beach. So there's this definite clash of of those two worlds. And, you know, in reality, that is exactly what happens on the beach. Right? All aspects of, of society in the Caribbean tend to meet on the beach. And, you know, the book really is about what life is like for people like Lala and Aiden in the face of all of this luxury um, that they're unable to participate in. In, in the section that Sherry read, we heard, you know, the, a, a police officer had arrived to interrogate Lala in this crime, the death of her child, and Lala's braiding here, and she's speaking, so her, she's sort of bodily interacting with a white tourist, and she's speaking of a, a friend, Tone, who works as a prostitute, who, you know, sleeps with women, older women who have traveled to the island. Um, in Sex and Vanity, there's a scene where Lucy and Cecil, her fiance, are having this kind of like very funny sex play, this very funny like erotic play, uh, uh, Downton Abbey themed erotic play. And he Cecil touches his fiance's body and says, you're mine, which is a, a thing that people say, and it is a romantic and sort of charged thing. But inside the context of a book, which establishes all of Cecil's material interests and possessions, it, it feels slightly different. It feels slightly jarring and feels like it does not bode well for that particular relationship. And in Mateo's book, as he mentioned, which I should have clarified at the outset, Darren is known throughout the novel as Buck. Now, there's a funny, there's a, like a triple meaning there, right? Because he's been found at Starbucks and he's in service of a startup who wants to accrue bucks. But of course, the most, the, the thing that is pressing on my mind is the notion of Black masculinity uh, as sexual service. And even in the section that we heard Matteo read, you're hearing him say to this billionaire who's about to bail out his company, I'm yours. I belong to you. And it hadn't occurred to me until I heard you and Sherry read those sections. I was like, oh, there is something very interesting about the relationship between money as like an idea, right? Currency or whatever, and the body. And all three of you are writing about the body. And so one of you talked to me about that particular thing. Maybe Matteo, you should explain to me how you landed on but like the moment where you were like, oh, his name should be Buck, like did the book coalesce or did you know that going in? Oh man, we're opening up a can of worms. So many different places <laughs> to go here. It's like, I knew that he was always going to be referred to as Buck and I knew about the, 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 the triple or um, four pronged in Tanja. Um, but for me, you know, and, and there are some people, especially some, some older black folk uh, that are like black buck. What is that? Like you know, mm -hmm. they're triggered. And I didn't, I didn't pick no. the title to provoke. Actually, uh, for me, it's a, it's a reclamation of sorts because Darren, he is not the unruly, untamable, enslaved black male that the white enslavers would refer to is going to burn down the plantation, steal the women, steal the pigs, and all that great stuff. But he is burning down what these organizations symbolize and stand for at least for a moment in time you know who knows what happens after the book but i'm so happy that you brought up ownership and and you also referred to uh kevin's book and and the role play that sounds wild uh because 
this might be a, uh, an extreme perspective, but I do believe that if someone is employed by an organization, that they are in part owned by that organization by virtue of the fact that they are giving them maybe eight hours, maybe nine hours, maybe 10 hours in the office or in the virtual office, right? And no one's tracking the time that you're thinking about your job that you're not getting paid for. You are giving them time that you will never get back ever. And what they are giving you is money in return. Maybe there are intangibles. What we see in, what we see in the book, you know, in my book, and what many people have probably seen in their own organizations, especially if you've worked in a startup, is that there was such a fine line between cult and culture, right? Mm -hmm. And there is a reason that all of these people get roped in or willingly or unwillingly give their bodies up to these organizations in time that they're never going to get back. So I'm just grateful that you brought up ownership because it is something that is uh, at the heart of this novel and in the part that I read it's, it's very on the nose and blatant but I think that what is oftentimes more dangerous is the ways that you allow people to own you uh without knowing and thinking that you're free. Cherry in your book you like as I said you write about the body we heard that section where Lala's fingers are in someone else's hair but there's a lot of really great I'm, I'm thinking of there's a scene early in the book where um, Lala's about to be born or what Lala's about to give birth, excuse me. And then there's also an extraordinary moment to Mateo's point where she's tagging along with uh, as her grandmother cleans the house. And what the grandmother says to her is, if you have to go to the bathroom, you can't go number two. It's like, you can't actually have a body you can't exist in your unruly black body within this home that belongs to white people. Um, so I wonder, Sherry, if you could talk a little bit about like your the way you were exploring that idea of ownership of the body in this work. So for me, I mean, the body, I think, and, and its ownership were really important in this novel, especially as it related to the women in the novel. You know, at its most basic, even when you have nothing, once you are alive, you have your body, you inhabit your body. And in this particular space, that's exactly what um, some of the characters choose to use to negotiate, to try to get out of the circumstances that they find themselves in. And that is especially true, not only true for the women, but it is, um, it is a, you know, a fact of life for the women in the novel. Generally speaking, that's how many of them try to, to transcend the circumstances in which they find themselves. <coughs> but what is also interesting about that is that while in some instances, for example, with the Queen of Sheba, um, the Queen of Sheba is a prostitute and uses her body to get money. And there, there seems to be a certain element of power to that, um, a certain level of agency in terms of how she negotiates her body in, in getting what she wants. But later on in the novel, I mean, the light in that is proven when, it, when we look at it within the context of the larger system and society. So she benefits from the protection of a member of the police force um who then exercises a level of dominion over her body so there's a question of the extent to which that body is truly hers within the context of the society in which she lives so there are lots of um i would say questions for me based on things that i've observed um in the caribbean and in barbados growing up as a female as a black female um, that I think came out in this book as it relates to the level of agency women have um, over their bodies, how bodies are used to transcend circumstances, um, and the extent to which we're constrained by, you know, society's expectations. 
expectations and norms in terms of how we can use that body um, within particular contexts. Mm -hmm. There's a there's an unlikely, I think, almost resonance with sex and vanity here because where Sherry is writing about people who sort of have materially nothing, um, Kevin is writing about people who have materially everything, but they find themselves similarly constrained. I mean, Kevin, do you think like, I don't want to spoil what actually happens in, in the romance and the plot of the novel, but like there was a point at which I was like, I, I described this before, that, that Lucy and Cecil are having this moment, this intimate moment, and it becomes this moment of ownership. And then I was like, oh God, is marriage just like a business deal? Like, do I not believe in like romantic marriage? And so then I want to ask you, Kevin, is marriage just a business deal or do we believe in romantic marriage? <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think both can exist at the same time in the reality of, the, of this book, right? Yeah. Because yes, you know, we have Lucy who, who is a romantic, who wants to believe in, in, in romance and falling in love with the right person. But at the same time, she finds herself in a situation where it is transactional in many ways. And I think that the scene that you mentioned kind of highlights the fact that, you know, she is, she's valued by Cecil, you know, who, let's just say it, it's just, a, you know, a materialistic <laughs> asshole, right? You know, he, he lives for his image, he lives for status, and he sees her as the ultimate status object, really. So he fetishizes her in this way. Um, and, and you could see that in, in, their, in their role play and in, in so many aspects of their relationship, you know, in, in the, his need to Instagram every moment they spend together. <laughs> um, that's his currency. That's, you know, <laughs> that is what gives him the cred. It's not just about money for him. Um, and on her end, however, you know, she's grown up, you know, biracial, you know, she's, she's mixed race and she has always felt this inferiority because of that with her very waspy blue blood relatives. And so she feels that, you know, the trade-off for her is, you know, I got to marry a billionaire. I have to do better than even, you know, my parents, my grandparents, I, I have to marry one of the richest men in the world in order to gain respectability with my own family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I yeah. think there's a mixture of, you know, the complexities of what is transactional yeah. and, and what is um, ideology. And what's, what's possible for a woman versus what's possible for a man, which is something that your book explores quite a bit, actually. I think that like, it's much, I think the book is generally more interested in its women than in its men. And um, again, you're writing about people who have everything materially, but their options are still almost as circumscribed by virtue of their sex as the women that Sherry is writing about which is a really interesting resonance. Absolutely. You know, I think some things just don't even change yeah. centuries later, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I want to switch gears from talking about like money as currency to talk a little bit about like debt and artistic debt in particular. Obviously, I mentioned that Kevin's book is indebted to Forster or sort of dancing on, on top of A Room of the View. But I wonder if you could all talk about influence and artistic debt and the writers who you feel connected to the writers and the writers who you felt this work has some kinship to. Um, I know it can be like scary to say like, I was inspired by this person. And I don't mean like a direct correlation, but the, the sort of the constellation or there's a family tree that sort of birthed this work. And I'm also really curious just as a technical matter, whether when you are all working on a novel, whether you're reading material related to that or whether you're reading something entirely different. Um, Sherry, why don't you start? 
Sure, I'd be happy to. So the last question first, when I am writing and really deep into um, a particular project, I tend not to read a lot of fiction um, at that point in time. I'll read nonfiction, um, but generally speaking, fiction, no, not, not while I'm working hard on something. Um, the writers that influence me, Toni Morrison, Earl Lovelace, um, Olive Senior, Olive Senior and Earl Lovelace would be Caribbean authors. Um, gosh, there's so many. Um, I know this is yeah, this is a hard question to answer. I know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's so many who would have influenced me at, at one point or another, but I think one of the things that I really really appreciated about Earl Lovelace, especially The Wine of Astonishment. I remember reading that book when I was at what we call secondary school, you'd say high school, I guess. Um, and that book really changed my life. I think, I don't think I ever looked at a villain the same again after The Wine of Astonishment. There was a, you know, a character in that book who went from being the star boy of the community to sort of the most feared, most, you know, awful person within that same, same community. But Lovelace just painted this character with such empathy um, and just managed to show him as the complex human being that he was. And I think prior to that point, I was quite young, but prior to that point, I think I probably, you know, read sort of angels and demons and never the twain shall meet you know mm -hmm. kind of like, mm -hmm. i think after that i i developed a real appreciation for complexity in humans and therefore in characters so i was just mm -hmm. never the same after after reading the wine of astonishment so earl lovelace yes very big inspiration i can think of others timothy calendar um, I mentioned B.S. Naipaul, Jamaica Kincaid, Alice Walker, um, Claude McKay. There's so many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, this this is the, this is the hardest question I'm going to ask you. So you can don't don't it'll it'll be much simpler after this. <laughs> uh, Kevin. Obviously, uh, you know, Forster, I would, I wonder if actually you could talk a little bit about A Room of the View specifically, but I'd, I'd be curious to know <coughs> what else was sort of in your family tree with respect to sex and vanity. <coughs> yeah, you know, I mean, um, this book has often been called an, an homage to Room of the View, and in, in some ways it very much is, but I really saw it really as a departure point really. And, and for me, E.M. Forster has, has been one of these authors that is able to look at the privileged classes um, in such a nuanced, intimate way. You know, he, he, he gives you an unexpected entry point into the lives of these people that, that to me is, is, is much, ends up being much richer than a lot of other people, you know, writing in the style that he wrote in. Um, so definitely he was, of course, you know, the first and foremost inspiration, but there have been so many others, I think that I would say helped to influence this book that I created. Um, Tom Wolfe, for example, Bonfire of the Vanities, um, Dominic Dunn, Edith Wharton, Evelyn Waugh. So, you know, there, there, there are these amazing writers who, who were so biting in their satire, um, that I, that I've always admired, um, mm -hmm that I think I, I could draw influence from when I created this book. Because as, as much as an homage to review is, this is also kind of my satire of New York City. And, mm -hmm. and the, you know, my years living in New York. Mm -hmm. Matteo, what about you? Yeah, um, when, I'm, when I'm writing, I'm always reading, but I try not to read anything too closely related to the subject at hand. Um, I don't wanna copy, you know, or as, as we say, bite, I'm not trying to bite off of them. 
Um, and I, I try to come up with ideas that are original, even though, of course, originality could just be a synthesis between my own experiences and things that I've heard or seen in the past, you know. Um, but when it comes to influences, I'll say that if anyone's ever read The Sellout by Paul Beatty, then you could probably feel the influence. I read The Sellout before I began writing Black Buck. And I said, <clears throat> shit, this is crazy. And it won a prestigious award. So I said, man, he, I felt as though he was giving me permission to, to just like go hard and not hold back. And I remember um, my first instance of running into the writer, Jason Reynolds. And, you know, Ramon actually profiled him for the New Yorker and Jason uh, became like a big brother to me. But the first time I met him, he, he's published millions of books, middle grade, young adult, so forth. He's coming out with an adult book. I ran into him at McNally Jackson on Prince Street. And me, young writer, no agent, no book deal. I said, can I buy you a cup of coffee? And Jason being so cool was like, yeah, man, yeah. So then I said, all right, I'm going to ask him some questions. And I said, have you read The Sellout? And he said, yeah, definitely. I said, man, I'm trying to write something like that. Just like, you know, something biting, something hard and sharp and, you know, something real though. And I remember he just took a sip of his coffee and he said, yeah, but you got to be good enough. So if you're going to do that, <laughs> you got to be good enough. Um, so that's definitely something that I had in mind while I was writing Black Buck to not just vomit on the page, you know, for a couple hundred pages, but to make it something that I'd be proud of and that would be coherent. So the sellout uh, was an influence. Um, definitely a lot of other writers that Jason's introduced me to after, after meeting him and spending some time with him. Uh, people in the Black canon that not all of us hear about or learn about in high school. So not just Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, Langston Hughes, and maybe if you're lucky, Zora Neale Hurston, but um, John A. Williams, who wrote The Angry Ones mm -hmm. and The Man Who Cried I Am. And when I read The Angry Ones, I realized that I was writing part of a larger and longer tradition about people, Black people, who have been the only one or one of the few in environments. Um, Ann Petrie in the street, uh, mm -hmm. Chester Himes, and If He Hollers, Let Him Go, Gail Jones and Corregidor, all of these books that were of the same ilk and that uh, reminded me or, or taught me that I wasn't alone. And that was inspiring for me to forge ahead and to, to write the book that I wanted to resonate with people in the way that I wanted it to. Um, I'll also say that there are contemporary writers, you know, Nafisa Thompson Spires and Heads of the Colored People. Um, Black Buck, I'm not gonna call it just a one-to-one -one satire, even though people love to call it that. There are satirical and absurdist elements, even though, honestly, I could picture all this shit happening, uh, despite how <laughs> we, but <laughs> through, through Nafisa's work and some of her essays and, and befriending her, I began to learn about rules of satire you know, or, or at least typical conventions. And that was helpful in crafting the book. And I'll say what else helped was um, sales manuals. When I got into the world of sales, these guys that I worked for handed me uh, this book called The Little Red Book of Selling in the Sales Bible by a man named Jeffrey Gittimer. And it was just like no nonsense. It was cloth, cloth covered pages, uh, cloth covered covers and glossy pages. And it's like this guy was screaming at you nonstop. You gotta do this. You got to do that. And um, I had also read How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia by Mohsin Hamed. And then I had read while I was revising Black Buck, uh, The Residue Years by Mitchell S. Jackson. So those mm -hmm. three sources coalesced when I was working on like the third or fourth draft of the book into saying, I want this to not just be an engaging narrative, but to also double as a sales manual. From the author's note, I'm breaking the fourth wall. Why don't I be very conspicuous about it and have direct addresses to the reader that are bolded and set apart mm. from the, the other parts of the, the, the paragraphs on the page so that people can see that these are life lessons disguised as sales lessons. And if they pay attention, not just to Darren's story, but to these maxims or pieces of advice that they might be able to walk away with uh, basic sales proficiency, not to just walk in and get a job at a startup, even though I think that it could help, but to more so advocate for themselves and those that they love. So the inspirations, as we all know, run deep. There's rappers, there's Nina Simone, Oprah Winfrey, people like that, people that were incredible at their craft, but lived beyond what they did and, and paid mm -hmm. attention to who they were and standing for what they believed in. Um, that sustained me throughout the writing of the book, for sure. 
Um, <clears throat> I, I always love hearing anyone talk about the sellout. The sellout for anyone who is watching who has not read it is one of the best American novels of the last century. Like there is really no question is an extraordinary, extraordinary piece of work. And it is the kind of work that I think, as you're saying, makes a younger writer feel like they have permission. You're just like, you can't believe, as Jason said, yes, you have to be a genius to accomplish what Paul Beatty did, but like that you could do that is extraordinary. Um, Matteo, you use the word satire and it's funny because Kevin used that word as well. Um, and I wanted to ask like all three of you, like. Sherry, when you're writing about like very serious material about sexual violence, about, you know, sexual, you know, <clears throat> I, I, I don't even like sexual violence. There's so much in this book. There's sexual violence, there's trauma, there's the loss of a child, there's like guilt, there's, I mean, there's a lot of material happening. Kevin, you're writing about something that is like comparably feels like frivolity, but you're doing it with like a particular perspective to like make a point about contemporary society. Matteo, as you said, you're working in like what people have called a more satiric register. Although interestingly, I think Paul Beatty also rejects the word satire when it's applied to his work. How does one accomplish writing about the serious as Sherry is doing, or as all, actually as all of you are doing without also being boring? and dour and too serious yourself. Like, how do you, how do you manage that tension? Any one of you, please answer this question. Explain, explain this to me so that I know how to do it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, Roman. This seems like a pretty tough one. I don't know, you said we passed the word. I did. I did tell you that. <laughs> um, yeah, how to write about about serious things without being kind of dour. Um, I don't know. I there isn't a lot of humor um, in my book. They, most things aren't treated, you know, in a particularly light way. I think. There is a subtlety in terms of how it's written, but the subject matter is weighty subject matter. And for me, I was very conscious of that, um, you know, while writing the book at points, it was hard for me to actually write it. It was wrenching. I had to put it down and come back to it just because I found it so tough to get through. Um, but for me, there was no kind of, you know, gimmick to it there was no apology there was no attempt to make it more palatable for a reader or for anybody else i just felt like this was the story and what was important to me was having the reader anybody who read this story had to kind of come into that room willingly sit down start to understand the horror of what was happening and then kind of recognize the door is locked. You can't get back out, but um, there is an investment in, in trying to understand how this story ends. It's like so compelling, you can't look away. So I can't say that I, I did anything or I set out consciously to make it easier or more palatable there was a little bit of balance. I mean, I remember at one point, one of my editors saying to me, gosh, Sherry, this is so heavy. Like, you know, for God's sake, you're on a beach in Barbados. Is there anything beautiful? Like, is it the sunset? Like, look at, you know? um, so we did talk about some of the descriptions because I think, you know, the coconut trees that are always on the postcards is like you put the hammock in between, you kind of lay down and, and lounge. You know, in my book, the kind of centipedes live there and they throw <laughs> coconut missiles and people have to try to dodge them and it's all death and horror. So maybe, maybe I wasn't so good at like balancing it or trying to make it easier for anybody but 
to me that. But I think that's, but I think that's your answer, right? It's that you do it yeah. directly. You yeah. do it by, there's a scene early in the book where she's in the hospital waiting room and she goes into the bathroom and there's no toilet paper in the bathroom. You have yeah. to see the nurse to get the toilet paper beforehand. And it is, it just, it looks so squarely at what is being described in a way that feels like the only way you can write about something that's base or ugly or so human. You know, you can't hide behind, you know, the language is lovely, but you're not hiding behind the language. You're looking directly at the thing, you know? And again, like the register in Kevin's book and Mateo's book is so different. And, you know, I, I, I'm not sure whether satire is the right word for either of those books, but I'd be curious to hear like Kevin, how do you write about people with affection, but also with a scalpel? Like, how do you manage that balance? You know, one of the writers I've always been extremely influenced by is, is Joan Didion. Mm -hmm. um, she's perhaps my favorite author. And mm -hmm. there is this kind of devastating surgical nature to her work. And I feel like in many ways, I'm sort of doing the same thing, but because the lens, you know, is focused on a certain set of people and what they're doing and what I choose to look at in, their, in that moment in, in these worlds, there is an absurdism I find mm -hmm. that people think is funny like I don't think I'm funny and like my books the quotes are like hilarious you know laugh out loud I'm you like, don't you, know, you don't think you're funny Kevin I, I find that very surprising seriously very I don't funny. think I'm funny at all <laughs> and you know when I first set out to write the originally the, the crazy rich agents trilogy it was meant to be a very kind of incisive angry look at to me um, just how obscene the level of wealth was that I was observing in contemporary Asia. Mm -hmm. um, and really the gulf between the have and the have nots, you know, was, was, was so exponentialized. I, I couldn't quite imagine it until the last couple of years living in this country, you know. Um, so I went into it with this notion of like, okay, this is gonna be a takedown of these people. And somehow what came out was Crazy Rich Asians, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not really doing a very good job, but I'm just uh, really sort of <laughs> explaining my process. Um, I guess it's a crazy one in a way because I just, I'm trying to just describe situations and tell the truth. Um, and somehow along the line of that, the truth emerges in its strange way and its strange form. Well, I think the answer is that the truth is so discomforting to people that they laugh because they don't know what else to do. Because the notion of people possessed of this kind of immoral wealth or this kind of like blinkered view of reality itself is so disturbing to the 99.99% of us who are not that person that we don't know what to do but laugh. Mateo, do you embrace or reject? I mean, you said people talk about Black Buck as satire in a way that suggests to me that you're like not wholly comfortable with that. Like, what do you think of that like label affixed to this work? I'm, I'm fine with it, you know, because it's not coming out of my mouth. Um, people can call it whatever they want, satire, trash, great book, whatever, like it's, it's on them, you know, as long as they read it, they make it at the end. It is astounding, sort of as you said, Ramon, that Kevin, you don't think you're funny. Do you think your book is funny? Do I think my book is funny? Yeah, do you um, think your book is funny? I think there's, there's definitely parts of it that, that are funny, yeah. Yeah, because I was laughing. Inadvertently. When you were reading, I was laughing so hard just because 
it felt, as you said, so true that there are these people on the Upper West Side or wherever, you know, if I die around the world in Iowa, probably that are just so rich and they're they're obsessed with like, no, she's not going to go to Bard. She can't go to Bard. It's just it, it's <laughs> comical because it's true. And because from my perspective, it's absurd, even though I understand where they're coming from, you know, even just from your short excerpt, I, I understood where she was coming from and why she would think that way, even if it is a bit absurd to me, it felt valid from her perspective. For me, when it comes to, to humor, I think it's exactly in line with what Sherry and, and Kevin said. I was looking to tell the truth. I was looking to render my experience and the experience of so many other people authentically on the page. And the way that I view the world, um, it's not all doom and gloom. Of course, there's tragedy and trauma, but there's triumph and levity and a lot of serious situations and scenarios are just hilarious. You know, you think about January 6th, that was my first event for Black Buck. And that was the storming of the Capitol, the, you know, insurrection or whatever. And it's dangerous seeing all these, you know, most of them white men at the Capitol got their feet kicked up on this hardwood table, like they're in their own house and doing all these things. But me watching them waving these flags around, mm. I'm like, yo, it looks like these guys just watched Braveheart and ran to the Capitol <laughs> and are trying to, you know, act out, you know, like Mel Gibson. <laughs> Or they're at, you know, a football game or something. It's hilarious to me, even though it's also dangerous. So when it came to Black Buck, part of me rendering my experience authentically is showing that, yeah, it's hard, you know, being the only one that looks like you. Yes, there's real trauma. Yes, racism is at times bizarre, absurd, sometimes innocuous to the point where you're like, did that actually happen? And it's horrible. Um, but at the same time, it's not like I wake up and I'm like, fuck, I'm black. Oh, sucks. <laughs> right? Like, it, 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 that, that's not the way that I live. Um, yeah. so, so humor for me was just natural. I think that it was a way to underscore the horror. And the last thing I'll say is that I had black people in mind while I was writing Black Buck. And there are far better writers than me who have written books that are very heavy and that are devoid of levity and that focus exclusively on serious topics. And I wanted to leave that for them and to write a book that the black people that I had in mind, um, but of course I'm grateful for anyone who reads the book, but especially would be able to read it and laugh and be like, yeah, that is some, that is some funny shit, right? That was mine. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to, um, take audience questions. And I actually think I'm gonna start taking them now, even though I have some other questions that I wanna ask. I think actually some of the audience questions seem to um, dovetail with one of what I'm thinking. And one of the questions that's so interesting to me, I'm gonna read the way that this is phrased. Um, is it really possible to satirize people with money and their narratives, particularly when centering them without celebrating what you're attempting to satirize simply by directing attention to luxury, et cetera. Has satire ever been effective when it comes to money? Kevin, you mentioned the bonfire of the vanities, which I think is like a very interesting test case book to answer this question. But I, wonder, I, I feel like this is probably a question you've been asked before, Kevin. So what do you think? It can can this kind of thing, the power and the um, the absurd the absurd kind of um, I don't know what's the word the absurd quantity of power concentrated in the hands of so few people, is it possible to satirize that? Has that been your experience? I think satire is one of the best ways to look at that topic. And I think it's something that's been done for centuries, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but it's, it, there's a grand tradition, I think, of writing about the wealthy and the powerful. Going back to Machiavelli, you know, going back beyond that, you know? And how do you portray these people? Um, to me, you know, there's something that 
satire is so effective as an entry point to looking at something that I think is normally so charged and so taboo and so not discussed, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, Jane Austen is another author yeah. that comes to mind, you know, yeah. that, that I think people don't think of her as a satirist. But if you, if you read her books with that lens, you know, go back to Pride and Prejudice and, you know, mm -hmm. look at Elizabeth Bennet's mother and all the machinating in her mind as she positions her children, you know, um, to make good marriages. Um, that's just one tiny example in so many, in so many other moments in that book and in other authors. So I, I really do think that it's, it's a way in that is perhaps palatable, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and it's, it ended up being my way in to telling these stories for all these characters over, over four novels now, you know, and completely unintentionally, like I said, you know. <laughs> I mean, money can buy you a lot, but one thing that money cannot buy you is the guarantee that somebody without money is not going to look at you and laugh, right? Like money can't really protect you from that. It can't like insulate you from being satirized. And <clears throat> I guess the question is, whether the reader can make that distinction. It's not really the writer's responsibility to make that distinction. It's sort of the pressures on the shoulders of the reader. Um, but that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, another question that came up in this Q&A that I think is sort of interesting is about the authorial relationship to money, not as a subject, but as the thing that gives you power inside of the business of publishing and how that affects your own work. Like publishing is a business and we, we are artists, but you're also responsible or beholden to a corporate force. How does that tension play out in your work? Matteo, tell me that. You spoke about you spoke about being employed and being owned earlier in this conversation. Um, how does that tension feel to you as a working artist? Yeah, it doesn't affect my work to any conscious degree. <clears throat> in terms of me sitting down in front of this blank word doc and writing, right? I'm not like, oh my god, this is gonna get me a million dollar advance. Let me write this shit. Like that's that's not it. But I will say that because of my background in sales and business. Um, I still do have that mind when it comes to what happens off the page and conversations there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, going into publishing or getting my foot in, this was my third manuscript and bringing up Jason again, Jason schooled me on the publishing industry. Um, he met me on my, while I was working on my second draft of Black Buck and I had, I had already queried two manuscripts, never found representation, but this third one, Black Buck, you know, I was getting ready for uh, uh, another round with it after I completed my draft. And he schooled me on what it meant to have a lead title and what it meant mm. for a publisher to have skin in the game. So, mm -hmm. When I got an agent and we worked on the book and then we went out on, out on submission to editors, when I first heard the editor say, this will be our lead title for spring, I said, okay, they're gonna put some skin in the game and they're going to put a good amount of money behind this because you know someone asked the question, and it was it, Sean, Sean Dempsey, um, about publishing, publishing to a certain extent is, is rigged, right? Like if, if a publisher thinks that your book is going to make them money, as Ramon said, publishing is a business, they're going to put money behind it in order to artificially make <clears throat> it pop to a certain extent. But if the book isn't good enough, then it's going to be a little flash and pan, it's going to go away. And if you don't make the publisher their money back, which is called earning out on your advance, you're, <laughs> you're not like blackballed but no one's gonna probably take that bet on you again in the same way, unless you're coming with like the Bible next, you know? Um, so for me, yeah, uh, when it comes to business conversations, 
I definitely want to feel as though a publisher has uh, skin in the game. I want to feel good about the, the number that I'm receiving. Um, but I don't think about it as I'm writing. And of course, when you publish a book, and if you're lucky enough to have people read it and to have people talking about it, you might have to work harder. I know I do at times, so like when I sit down in front of the Word doc to not think about readers, to not think about my editor, to not think about my agents, um, but it's not impossible. The last thing I'll say is that if you have a book, right? I mean, I can only imagine what you experienced, Kevin. Uh, but if you have a book that pops in a certain way, there are more opportunities, economic, financially uh, advantageous opportunities that people want to put in front of you. Um, but what's most important for me to remember is that no matter which celebrity I meet, no matter which fancy dinner I give a speech in front of, it's not going to help me write better. <laughs> it's not the work. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't help mm -hmm. me when I sit down in the corner of my room over there and try to figure out how to use the same 26 letters to write something, you know what I'm saying? So that, that's my incomplete answer. <laughs> well, as you say, to be a writer, uh, a, pub a writer working in publishing, say a writer who's active in commercial publishing is to kind of have these two jobs. One is as an artist and one is as the sort of like, the businessman is willing to sit in those meetings and talk to your publicist and, and behave like be a good partner to your publisher. But Sherry, you have a whole other job. So I wonder if you could talk about the relationship between like, is art a kind of like outlet separate from your legal practice? Or do you see some relationship between the two? So I mean, how do, and also just how do you do both of those things and not have hair as gray as my beard? I don't know. I don't understand. Explain yourself, please. I think you're still on mute, honey. Yeah, sorry about that. So no what problem. I would say is that writing is intrinsic to who I am as a person. So before there was a career, I wrote. I always wrote, I'll, I'll continue to write. One of the interesting things about it was I had this big plan about how I was going to get an agent and a book deal, and I had it kind of all planned out step by step. Um, and I worked that plan for probably just over 20 years without anything happening. And interestingly enough for me, it was at the point at which I kind of I, I, did, I wouldn't say abandon the plan, but the plan became less important and the work returned to sort of preeminence because before that, yes, I was working, but it was always kind of like, yeah, and I'm going to get, because I want to be able to just do this full time. So that's what I'm working towards. And a couple of things went wrong in, that journey and I kind of had to just kind of look at myself one day and say you know what whether you get the agent or the book deal or whatever you're still gonna write so just just let it be about the writing and that was one of the things I did because you know in this journey I've done all this I quit my job and you know decided I was gonna devote myself to my writing like thousands and thousands of miles away from home you know writing is a little bit harder when you need to figure out how you're gonna eat first you know so there there was there were some interesting lessons that i learned um i've done that i've quit everything and sort of just given it up for the writing and had to come back to the day job and i started to look at my writing almost as i did um my child in that I just had this strong sense that as much as possible, I wasn't going to burden my work with a requirement to give back to me. I, if anything, I needed to do what I needed to do to try to support it. So there was, after that, there was no question of not working, not having some sort of job. It was about giving this work, the space and the, and the nourishment to kind of grow and be its best self. I think once I got rid of some of those notions, it, it's so ironic. That's when 
I got the yeah. age and the book deal and all the rest of it when I'd given up on that. So I think that was a really, a really important lesson for me personally in terms of my, um, my legal career. I would say the two things influence each other. They, you know, certainly when the book that I'm working on now, for example, my ability to do research, because I've had to do a lot more research for this particular work than, than say, how the one arm sister suites are out. Um, I think my legal training helps with that. Um, and I think my, my creativity helps me in my legal practice with coming up with stories about things, how things happen, how things might go, how best to respond to particular things. But generally speaking, it's almost like two different sides of my brain um, that operate. And really the career is about being able to give myself that time and space um, to do my work, which I consider my, my calling, my true calling. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, I want to ask you the same question because as Mateo pointed out, like you're someone who's really been successful in publishing and you yourself sort of described your falling into this material almost by accident, this material that you've explored across four books that like it wasn't necessarily what you thought you were going to be doing artistically <clears throat> Does that come with a different kind of responsibility now? Then, or, or are you surprised by the way that you feel about like how it feels to have published so successfully and what it means for whatever comes next for you artistically? Or do you feel free? Like you could just do, you could write a book of sonnets next and you would be fine with that. Like how, how do you sort of reconcile that? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, um, you know, Crazy Rich Asians, when I first wrote it was, truly um, a passion project and was never meant to be published at all. Um, I really thought it had absolutely no commercial potential, um, but it was a story I wanted to write and just share with a few friends, maybe self-publish. So it's, it's interesting, you know, just listening to what Sherry had to say also in terms of like, when you, when you leave all the notions of wanting to construct that bestseller, and you just write from the heart and you write from your truth. Look what happened, because I don't know, most people don't know that I had a whole car career in publishing before Crazy Rich Asians, um, where I mainly worked on non nonfiction books. And there were all these sort of like really clever ideas I was trying to sell, you know, um, that never sold, you know. Um, there were lots of hits and misses. And, and so it's, it's funny, this was supposed to be, you know, not even on, the hit or miss pile. This was the personal pile um, that had I known would have done so well, I probably would have published it under a whole different name, quite frankly. Um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting now, the success of Crazy Rich Asians on that trilogy, in a strange way, it's paradoxical. It's, it's freed me to be a little more kind of um, experimental um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of now writing book two of this new trilogy, which uh, each book is going to be an homage to a different classic. You know, the first one, Sex and Vanity, was an homage to Room of View. The second one, you know, I can't tell you yet what it's going to be about. But so, oh, what I'm, a tease. <laughs> you know, it's given me license to sort of like play in a way, and, and because for me, you know, that's a challenge, right? Like, how do I take this beloved book um, and, and, and really kind of like keep, make it my own, you know, reinterpret, reinvent. Um, so I guess since I've made the publisher some money, I can now afford to make them lose money. <laughs> that's why I'm looking at it. And I can just really be more creative. <laughs> This isn't well, really, recorded, I mean, right? I think, <laughs> but I mean, really what I think is, is, is that you have to take money out of this equation in some strange way, because as you said, like, and as Sherry said, like, and, you know, Matteo described like writing books that didn't succeed prior to Black Buck that didn't like get to the publisher, like, 
you actually just have to do what you want to do. You can't, if it were possible to calculate a way to write a bestseller, then more people would do it. You know, like if it were possible to write a book that was going to become a really big movie, well, then certainly everybody would do it. And that's part of the reason it drives me crazy when people read, when certain people uh, disdain um, commercially successful books, because it's not easy. It, it's not easy. And sometimes it's about luck. And sometimes it's about a different kind of intelligence. And anyway, I think that like the success of something like art can't really be measured in dollars anyway, right? Mm -hmm. You just have to go back to your desk. Mateo has to go back to that little corner in his room and like get back to writing, you know? Um, I got, I feel like I should have like a really big final question. And my big final question is like really, it's really dumb. And now I'm, don't want to ask it. I guess maybe I'll ask you this question um, about place because uh, place is really evocative in all three of these books. Um, and for Kevin in particular, the way that you write about Italy and for Sherry, the way you write about Barbados and for Matteo, the way that you write about Brooklyn. People always ask writers, I think writers of fiction, whether like the books are about real people. Um, and I think that that's a lot, I, I don't think it's true. Fiction is not about real people necessarily, even if you steal from them, but you're all writing about real places. And I wonder if that felt like a challenge to you to write about this place that you loved. Um, Kevin, especially when you mentioned wanting to write this book in Italy, but not being able to actually be in Italy. I mean, I even dedicated the book to Capri. So, I mean, it, it, you know, it's a place that so inspired me in a way that it's inspired so many, many other authors. But, it, you know, as much as the book is about Capri, it's also my Valentine to, to Manhattan, you know? So that, that to me has, has equal weight within this book. And yeah, I think you really see that both these places, Capri and New York, become characters of their own, I think, you know, within the novel. So they're, they're always, you know, places always central to me. You know, and the way that Singapore was so important to the Crazy Rich Asians trilogy. Right. Sherry, you talked about having like a different perspective on the palm tree with the hammocks. Like you're seeing it from a sort of different angle. Did that feel like frightening or challenging to write about Barbados, a place that you know and inhabit for a readership that doesn't know it the same way? Did that feel scary to you or like it came with a responsibility? It wasn't, it wasn't scary. And I kind of um, ditched the whole notion of responsibility to anything other than the story that I'm writing. Yeah. Um, a couple of years back in my, in my writing career. But, you know, for me, writing is, is often the way that I work things out in my mind. I, I wrestle with stories. I wrestle with concepts in my work. And, you know, I think I do have a pretty complex relationship with Barbados. It's definitely um, a love-hate type thing. It's like, it's this beautiful place. And, you know, there are lots of lots of things about it that people would consider wonderful but there are other aspects you know to it as well um and i think that's that's one of the things that i i saw come out in this in this work um that complex relationship with this place with this island that i'm on surrounded by water that people come to because it's so beautiful um but there are other aspects to it that I wanted to talk about that were relevant to this story. So for me, there was no responsibility. You know, people have asked me, like, are Bajans mad? You know, do they kind of look at you and say, oh, you know, you're airing dirty laundry in public. How could you tell people about this aspect? Like you're damaging tourism or whatever. Um, <laughs> I didn't feel that at all. I didn't feel that responsibility. I just felt that I had to um, write about this place and explore this place in the context of this story. So it wasn't hard, um, but definitely, you know, 
Barbados as a whole and the beach in particular, I think became a character much like, um, you know, as Kevin said, um, in this novel, the beach just, you know, it's really, really important. Um, it's central to the story and the story wouldn't be the same without it. Mateo, how about you? How was that experience of rendering Brooklyn on the page? It feels like a place that you know. Was that fraught or did you feel free to do whatever you wanted? Um, I felt free, but I didn't make up a bunch of stuff. You know, I might have placed a barber shop in a certain place where it didn't exist. Um, when it came to Brooklyn, no, it wasn't difficult. I lived down the street when I was 21 and on my own version of the come up, you know, working in the world of startups and sales back when I wasn't even in sales at the startup, I was an intern. And these people wouldn't even pay for a $45 Metro card. Um, but I was living in Bedside down the street from where a lot of those scenes take place. And when it came to the office, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, and I could I could say this because I passed it through lawyers. I said it in the same exact building I worked in. <laughs> I said it at Three Park Avenue, where I worked with the same Starbucks I used to go into. <laughs> and I had to call out a whole legal there because I was like, all right, should I make it one Park Avenue, even though I don't even know if this? I said it in the same exact place. I switched up the office a little bit just so I wouldn't have the 230 people I used to work with being like, oh my God, he wrote about the place one-to-one. -one. I'm like, nah, we never had this type of coffee. But um, what's crazy is that when we were on submission with my publisher, they said that they are located in the same exact building. So they thought that I had tailored the narrative to them at Three Park Avenue. I said, that's genius. But no, I didn't tailor where it was set. I didn't know that you were in that building. And I hope you never saw me many years ago when I was there. Because I wasn't acting right. But, um, but yeah, I, I, for me, it was very important for these two worlds where a lot of the book takes place, Manhattan, and Brooklyn, more specifically Midtown and Bed-Stuy, to be almost two complete different worlds with their own uh, species, almost, of, of people and sounds and foods, because I wanted the contrast between who Darren was and where he was starting from and where he was going to be so stark that the reader would just feel it uh, subconsciously that something's off and that there are going to be consequences that Darren's going to have to pay for from moving from one world to another, even though it's just a mile or so away in the no. way. Yeah. Just a subway right away, but a world right. away. Um, okay. Again, like the selling your own book is very embarrassing. So I'm going to sell it on behalf of these writers. This is Kevin, Kevin Kwan's Sex and Vanity. It really made me want to go to Capri. Mateo's book, Black Buck, beautiful book. And this is Sherry's book, How the One-Armed Sisters Fixed Your House. It was such a pleasure hearing from all of you tonight. Really, I wish it could have happened in person. Before we go, Amanda Liao from the Penn Faulkner Foundation has a few words for everyone, but thank you all of you. It was such a great pleasure to talk to you guys tonight. Thank you, Ruman. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Ruman. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to give another big thank you to Ramon, Kevin, Mateo, and Sherry for tonight's illuminating conversation on money, satire, bodies, and place, and so much more. And thank you to each of you on the other end of the screen for being here with us tonight and for asking such thoughtful questions that allowed for the breadth and depth of this space. If you enjoyed tonight's program, I hope that you will consider contributing to Penn Faulkner by completing our post-event survey, and if you're able, by making a donation through the link that we'll provide in the chat. Literary Conversations is one way in which we connect and support readers and writers of all ages in Washington, DC, and beyond. By making a donation, you help us celebrate literature and continue to make literature accessible for all, from students in Title I schools across DC who currently face systemic barriers to accessing multicultural literature in their classrooms, to literary lovers like yourself from across the nation and around the world who believe that literature offers us an invaluable lens through which we can understand and shape the world. 
from our three national awards to our education programs and our upcoming literary events, you can learn more about Penn Faulkner's work by visiting our website at penfaulkner.org or by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Penn Faulkner. Once again, thank you for being part of our literary conversation tonight. Have a great evening, and we hope to be with you soon.